Exactly. So that's really what we're all here to do, is to learn how to care more, how to love more, and how to share more. So on that topic, I have a quick joke. Because remember, it's all about changing our consciousness. Isn't that what we just affirmed? Consciousness is everything. So these three lawyers are on a, I hope, okay. Three lawyers are on their way, this journey, by train, and they buy three tickets. And as they're walking away from the, the ticket booth, they th see three engineers coming to buy tickets. And they buy one ticket. So of course the lawyers are watching. So the three lawyers get on, the three engineers get on, the lawyers are sitting, and the three engineers, they all go to the bathroom, and they're waiting in the bathroom. So the guy coming to collect the tickets, he collects from the three lawyers, and then he goes to the bathroom door, and he knocks, and one hand reaches out, gives him the one ticket. Closes the door, he continues, they get out. So a few days later, after they've all arrived, it happens that the lawyers and the engineers are back on the return trip. So this time the lawyers, the three lawyers get in, and they buy one ticket, and now they're watching the engineers. The engineers just walk right by, and they don't even buy a ticket. So they're all getting on the train, and of course the three lawyers hiding in the bathroom. So one of the engineers comes, ticket please, gets the one ticket. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea, it's about looking at things differently. So as I wrote on uh, Facebook, what I'd like to speak about this morning is prosperity. And we all have an idea of what prosperity means, but let's look at it Kabbalistically. Because what we want to get today is a new consciousness of what prosperity is. So if I asked you, and I might get a different answer because of who I'm speaking to, but is, if you had $10 million in the bank, would you feel prosperous? How about, how about a billion dollars? Would you feel prosperous? Would you have no worries? Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. That's the key. How many of us know people who have all the physical things, but they still don't have happiness, they don't have peace of mind, they don't have health, they don't have good relationships? So then prosperity is not just about money. So money can be a conduit that we'll talk about this morning, but money in and of itself is not prosperity because of those things that we see. And especially in the world today, we see people who have a lot and we see the misery that's there. What about people who win the lottery and then they don't know what to do with their money. So they just go spend it wildly, and within a few years, and this is a very typical situation, they're either broke, or they're miserable, or they're dead. Or you have the people who die, and they have a lot of money in the bank. Not good either, right? In fact, that reminds me, I, just, I saw once um, a bumper sticker, you know, on a, a car driving down the street, it says, we're enjoying life, we're spending our children's inheritance. <laughs> okay. So where does it all start? We go back as we always do, at least in a simple way, the Garden of Eden. What happened in the Garden of Eden? In Kabbalistic terms, it's a metaphor for a perfect world. The Garden of Eden was heaven on earth. The Garden of Eden, we were perfect. In the Garden of Eden, everything was clear. We had no illusion, no doubt, no fear. Why? Because everything was set out for us and we knew it. We knew without a doubt that God the Creator, the Light Force, had set out everything for us. Because what else is the nature of God but to give all of its beneficence to its crea creations? So you and I, in the Garden of Eden, we had everything. We knew we were prosperous, healthy, wealthy, had great relationships. Everything we could imagine today, we had it in the Garden of Eden. So what happened? So we've talked once or twice, but again, just to remind you, when they say the sin of Adam and Eve, we know Kabbalistically, we don't call it sin, because you can't hurt God. So there's no sin to God. There's mistakes we can make, and at the same time, we can fix them. So what was the mistake you and I made as Adam and Eve? We separated the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. We separated the physical from the spiritual. And in today's world, relative to our, our discussion this morning, what does that mean? We found value in the money and not in the light of the Creator. We separated spirituality from physicality. So there are many people out there who think spirituality means to go up to the mountain, isolate yourself from the entire world, 
Don't be involved in anything. No people, no money, no relationship, no business, whatever. And just meditate on the power of the Creator. Kabbalistically, that's not spirituality. Spirituality is when we're involved in the world and we're bringing our spirituality with us. If Adam and Eve's mistake, and you and I are still living pieces of it, was to separate, to see a distinction between the spiritual and the physical, then what is that? It means that we put more value, unfortunately, in the physical, isn't it? What do they say? The golden rule. He who has the gold gold rules. (laughs) Right? We've heard that before. We've heard that kind of thing. It's not that way. You and I are learning here that it's not just the physicality. You ever bought something and then didn't enjoy it after a month? How come? You bought it. When we buy things, what is money? Money, we go to the store. When you pay money for something, what do you get? You get a commodity. You get an item. You go to Publix. You give them money. You walk out with groceries. You go to a car dealer. You give them money. You walk out with a car. So you're exchanging money, and that's what people will say. Money is just a system of exchange. So you give a certain amount of money, you walk away with an item. But how much value does that money have? It's a question. We decide. We decide. What is money? If you think in the simplest terms, even in a physical level, you work 40 hours a week, you put in your time, your effort, your labor, etc., and what do they give you at the end of 40 hours? They give you money. So what's inside that money? Your life force, your effort, your talent, your ability, the energy that you put in your job or the way you get the money, that's in the money. Now, when you go to the store, the value of that money is up to you and you alone. You're the only one who decides. And how do we decide? Think about it. You go into the mall, you're shopping. I love when my my daughter takes her girlfriends and they go shopping. I can't shop. I want to go to the mall. I want to buy what I want to buy and then walk out. They, I don't know, maybe it's teenage girls, I don't know. But they walk and they shop and they look and they, they, you know, that's what they call shopping. To me, shopping was always, you go to the grocery store, you buy groceries. You go to the mall, you buy your clothes. Okay, I guess it's entertainment now. I think more, more of the entertainment is watching each other and then actually buying or looking at the items. But you're walking in this, by the store and you see the big display window and something attracts your attention. Now you say, wow, I'm interested in that item. So you walk into the store and you look at the price tag. Now comes your decision. And again, every one of us are unique. You look at the price of that item and you're deciding now, is the joy and the pleasure of the money in your pocket worth more than your perceived joy and pleasure of that item. If you have more joy in your measure of the money in your pocket, you're not going to buy the item. But if or when you decide that the joy you're going to derive from that item is more joy and pleasure than the money in your pocket, guess what you're going to do? You go buy the item. So nobody else can tell you the value of your money. But what we're here to learn this morning is how to make money give us lasting prosperity. Because as we're seeing, the prosperity doesn't come from the money itself. The money comes from the light of the Creator that we connect to within the money and or the things we buy. And that's why when I asked you, you ever bought something and after a month or two you don't enjoy it anymore? If everything in the physical world has the light of God in it, how can we not enjoy it? When you bought it, how did you feel? Felt great. My first new car. I spent months researching, looking, what did I want? You know, but of course, it was all based on what? I have to be honest. It was based on how I would feel, how I would look, how good the car would be for me. So I buy the car. The first few months, I'm washing and waxing every weekend. Nobody eats, drinks, smokes, nothing in the car, including me. If I go to the mall or I'm going to park the car, I park as far away as I can so I can take two spaces that nobody opens their door in my car. You get the picture, right? It was great. The physicality of the car is what, in essence, I had bought. How do I know? 
because after about three, four months, I wasn't washing and waxing the car every weekend, maybe every other, every three weeks. If I was in a hurry, nobody else could eat, but I could eat, <laughs> right? Because I was careful. Slowly, 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 I lost the fulfillment that I had when I first bought the car. When I came to the Kabbalah Center and learned what you and I are learning now, I understood why. Because even though there was light in that car, I wasn't connecting to the light. I didn't have the consciousness to connect to the light. I didn't appreciate that the light was in the car. So all I saw was the nice fabric, the electric windows, the digital dash, electric sunroof, all those things. I saw all the good, and I saw how good it made me look. <laughs> and I'm not saying you should have a horrible car, okay? So please don't <laughs> interpret that either, right? It's not about the car, it's about the consciousness. Consciousness is everything. So when we will connect to the light in the car, then you can have a car, and even after months, you still enjoy it. And you want to know something? Even if that car goes away, you'll still feel the joy and the happiness because it wasn't about the physicality, it was about the light that you connected with. So when does the light leave you? Never, unless you let it go. So the car may come and go, physical things may come and go, but our joy and our fulfillment and our pleasure don't have to. That's what we're learning here, is how to maintain that joy, how to constantly inject light into everything that we have. Because when we do, what could be more prosperous? There's a very nice Kabbalistic story. I know we all go, wow, how can I make that happen? Of a gentleman who was blessed. Whatever the story was, he was blessed by the Creator that he would always have whatever he needed. And literally, he'd walk into a restaurant, and at the end of the meal, they'd say, okay, your bill is $15.33. He would just reach into his pocket, and guess what he pulled out? $15.33. If he went to the grocery store, and something he was buying was $2.53. $2.53. And that's just the way it worked. What could be more prosperous? Do we have to have money in the bank to feel prosperous? If we do, then we're in the wrong consciousness. If we do, then we're in the wrong consciousness. We're here to understand it's injecting the light and connecting to the light because that's what we made the mistake as Adam and Eve. We disconnected the spiritual and the physical. So our job is to reconnect the spiritual into the physical. That's why the Kabbalists never ran away to isolate themselves. Because, I mean, think about it. When we, as Adam and Eve, split the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, we split the physical from the spiritual, what happened then? What did the Bible tell us about the way we earn a living? Looks at Adam, creator looks at Adam and says, now, by the sweat of your brow, you will plow the field, etc., etc., to earn a living. So don't we say, blood, sweat, and tears. We have to make an effort. But the effort is not just, well, we'll work 60 hours, we'll put all our effort in, we'll get a better education. That's not the effort that the Bible, according to the Kabbalists, is really teaching us. It's the effort we're speaking about today. How to bring the spirituality into the physicality. Because that's the way we'll enjoy what we have. Because again, we all know people who have a lot and they don't enjoy it. How could they not enjoy it? If having all the things is the enjoyment, the light of the Creator is the source of our fulfillment. And therefore we have to learn how to inject light into everything. So I want to give you a couple ways that that happens. One, if you read in the book of Exodus, it's a very interesting story, but you only really get it if you go back to its original language. The story goes like this, if you remember the basics. The Israelites, who are all of us, the spiritual people, were enslaved in Egypt, right? We're enslaved in Egypt. Now, for those of you who are new, Egypt doesn't mean the country or the people. What Egypt represents Kabbalistically is our ego and our self-centeredness and our selfishness and our illusion. So how many of you happen to know people who are trapped in their business? Right. Right? They can't go away for a week. They can't get a few days because the business may fall apart. So who's the owner? Do they own the business or the business owns them? I was owned by my car those first three, four months. I wasn't the owner of the car because I had to wash and wax it. I had to make sure nobody ate in it. I had to do all those things. So it wasn't my car. I was the slave to the car. That's what Egypt represents. 
It wasn't like we think, you know, there were people beating them and whipping them and the rest of it. Because if that were true, I give you a question to think about. Go back and check in the Bible. How come if it was so horrible, how come when they're in the desert wandering for 40 years, almost every other day, they kept looking at Moses and saying, Moses, what did you take us out of Egypt? We had watermelon, we had cucumbers, we had fish, we had meat. So it couldn't have been so bad, like we think slavery, if they constantly wanted to go back. But it was the slavery that we can fall into sometimes, the illusion of the physical material. So here Moses was taking them out. And it says, if you look at it carefully, it says, and God put, it's called hen in the eyes of the Egyptians. And what did the Israelites do before they left? It says they went to their neighbors and they asked of them all the gold and silver. And they were given and they left with it. So you think, wow, well, what would you expect? If you were beaten up by those ten plagues and the people who weren't beat up by it come to you, and they say, okay, give us gold and silver and we'll leave you alone. The plagues will end. What would you do? Of course you give them the gold and silver. Right? Go away. Get out of here. Just leave me alone. Right? Let me go back to peace. But it doesn't say just ask. In the original Aramaic Hebrew term, it says vaishalu. They borrowed. Borrowed. And it's a very important Kabbalistic lesson. If I borrow something from you, what do you expect of me a few days later? Return. To return it. And to return it how? The same condition or even better. You let me borrow your car, the gas tank is half empty. When I return it, I'll return it a full tank. I know, now you wanted me to borrow your car. Okay, I get it. <laughs> but you understand the idea? It's to borrow. So borrow means we are not the owner. That's what the real lesson is. We don't own our money. We don't own our talents and ability. We don't own our car. We don't own our family and friends. We believe we do. Why? Because we earned it, didn't we? Didn't you work 40 hours to get the money? So you earned it. It's not ours. It's still borrowed. And the easiest way to know that is a fact. Can't take it with you. You could bury it in the coffin, but can you really take it with you? You imagine the guy goes upstairs and all the, the judges up there going, let's see, how much money did you bring with you? Right? Doesn't work that way. A person dies, the only thing they leave behind is the good works they've done. The actions of sharing the light. So the first lesson, if we're going to awaken true prosperity without all the bad side effects, is first to realize and have the consciousness doesn't belong to us. When you go to work, whose talents and abilities are you using? Yeah, now you've got a question, I get it. But don't we say, God-given talent and abilities. So who gave it to us? They belong to the light. Same thing, when a person is dead, how much are they using their talent and abilities? They're not. So it's not our talent and ability that we used at work. It's not our time and energy or our protection that we used to get to work to use the talent and ability. All belongs to the Creator. So this one verse particularly in the Exodus is teaching us we can't own it. We can't own it. But what can we do? We can be great managers of it. And the better we manage it, then the more blessed we are. That's the key. The more we inject light into all the things we do, and in this case, in our money, the more enjoyment we will have. The second aspect comes from that. It's to realize if the Creator is the source of all my good, in this case, all my prosperity, then the Bible says like this, of all the good God gives you, you'll give away 10%, called tithing. What's the power of tithing? I mean, imagine a farmer, farmer sitting with an empty field, he wants to raise oranges. He's got a handful of orange seeds, and he says to the universe, give me the oranges, and then I'll think about putting the seed in the ground. Does it work or it doesn't work? Why not? Yeah, you got to plant the seed. You plant the seed. Now, once you plant the seed, what happens? Who makes the tree grow and give fruit? Does the farmer? Does the farmer? Really, the farmer reaches into the dirt after he plants the seed, pulls the roots out. Then the farmer reaches in and pulls the trunk out. 
and then the farmer takes the trunk and pulls the branches. Is that what the farmer's doing? The farmer manages the universal process of the seed growing. It's a natural process. We just work with it to go along with it. So the Kabbalists teach us the same idea in tithing. You're planting seeds. You're acknowledging the fact that it comes from the Creator. And so by using it to bring light and illumination and benefit to others, what do you get for it? You, get, you plant one seed of an orange tree. How many fruit on the tree? One? Many. So that's the same idea. Every spiritual book on prosperity will tell you the first rule is tithing. First rule. Because it, not only are you planting seeds to grow, but think of it. We all here, in some level, have a limited co consciousness. I don't care if you do happen to have a billion dollars in the bank, we still have, until we really apply in Kabbalah, we have a limited consciousness. Think of a billionaire, any billionaire on the planet. Which billionaire on the planet is showing us that they believe that they have, with their billions, the power to remove all the darkness and chaos from the world? Bill Gates? Really, he believes he can remove all the pain and suffering, he can remove the angel of death, he can remove everybody's chaos. No. These billionaires, many of them, they're giving away money. I'm not discrediting them in that way. But do you think with all the money that they have, they believe they, they can stop all the death, all the destruction, all the fighting, all the poverty, all the chaos, all the d disease in the world? No. no. So then it's not a matter of the money, it's the consciousness behind it. So you and I are now learning how to be unlimited. Because what will remove all the pain and suffering and all the darkness from the world? The light of God. And guess what? Where is that light of God? It's inside of us. We're carrying it everywhere. But we have a limited consciousness. We don't believe that we have that power to remove all the darkness of the world. Yes, so we'll pray to God. God, please remove the pain and suffering from the world. Well, it hasn't worked in 5,776 years in Kabbalistic counting. So why do you think tomorrow God's going to wake up? Or we go back to the lesson we learned about the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the tree of life. We, with free will, separated them. It's we, with our free will, will bring them back together. So imagine the power that we have, and especially here because we're learning that consciousness. So you unlimit yourself. If I have a glass here... If I have this cup, and you have an infinite supply of water, how much water can you give me with this glass? Eight ounces, whatever the glass will hold, right? Now, if I cut the bottom off the glass, how much water can you pour through the walls of the glass? Unlimited. That's what tithing does. By giving that 10%, it's like taking the bottom, the limitation, off. And therefore allowing all that the Creator already set out for us. That's what we want to acknowledge. The Creator already gave us everything. We have to live into it. We have to manifest it. Not we have to draw it from the cosmos. It's already there. In the seed is waiting the fruit that's going to grow from it, is it not? Let's say the 50 oranges that will come off that one tree. It's already in the seed. But if the farmer holds the seed in his hand or puts it on his table in his kitchen, then all those 50 fruit won't grow from it. It's once you plant it, the universe will take over. And therefore, we see those kinds of stories. We see people who overnight achieve wealth and peace of mind and prosperity. In fact, someone just told me recently, they have a friend who makes $6 million a month. Not bad, huh? So the student asked him, says, what happened? How did you do that? He says, I just make sure I'm giving away my 10% and everything seems to come my way. Pretty powerful. I mean, imagine, are you and I giving $600,000 a month? Yeah, I know we all say, but if I had six million a month, I'd be happy to do that. So, uh, you know the story of the guy who's shipwrecked Right? He's in the middle of the ocean, and uh, his boat capsizes, and he's like a few miles from the shore, so he starts to swim. And he's getting tired, and he's getting tired. You know, his arms and legs are tired and difficult. So as he's starting now to go under the water, 
Right? He starts to pray to God, God, please help, help, help. Please help me, I'll give you anything. So he's trying to trudge on a little more, a little more. He says, God, God, I'll make sure. I'll give, I'll give 50% of my income away. And he's swimming, 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 swimming. Okay, I'll give 60% away. And then as he finally gets near the shore, he says, you know what, God? 50% may be a little too much. You know, what about, what about 30%? What about 20 And he starts to bargain. You get the idea. So, okay, it doesn't turn out well. But you all understand the idea. When we're in need, we're willing to say anything. The key is now, while we're not in need, the power of what we're learning in the center is not have to get to that point. Why should a person have to be sick to learn how to maintain their health? Why should we, a person have to be poor in order to maintain wealth and peace of mind? Why? Why should we have to get there? No reason. So what we're learning here is how to avoid it, how to prevent the chaos before it happens. But what does that necessitate? what we learn in the Garden of Eden, to make an effort. You have to make an effort to achieve it. The other thing I want to make sure before we go, that all of this doesn't make you think that our value is based on the money we have. It's very important. If a person values themselves relative to the money they have, Kabbalistically, it's a huge ego. You say, but what about the person who has nothing? Right? And they're feeling themselves nothing because they don't have. That's also ego. Because ego just means separation from the light of the Creator. So whether it's separation thinking they're less than or separation thinking they're more than, it's still separation from the Creator. The Creator made each and every one of us 100%. Gave each and every one of us 100%. And that's why we can see. Imagine the person. I have a student here in Boca who is going through tough times financially and started to feel that his worth, his value in the community had dropped because he didn't have money. So as I'm sharing with you, I made him wake up and realize, no, the value we have is the value that the Creator put inside of us. There's not a single one of us who can be replaced in this world. And once he started to awaken that consciousness, sure enough, things miraculously started to get better because he changed his consciousness. He started to act as if he understood that the Creator is his source, the light is his source, not the money. The money is not your source of happiness. The light of the Creator is the source of your happiness. And that's why, imagine, but there are people like that. I knew a gentleman years ago, he lost $120 million. We tried to help him gain it back, but he lost his consciousness. His value went so low that that was it. He had no hope, he had no, no openness to understand he could gain it again. So you and I are sitting here understanding what true prosperity is about. True prosperity is when we're injecting light into everything we do, and in this case in particular with all our finances. Inject light, appreciate it. Don't measure your value by it, don't measure other people by it, but understand the value is what we understand the value of the light is. Uh, and what's the value of the light? That's what we have to decide. I had a student not long ago tell me, you know, why do you guys charge for Kabbalah classes? I said, well, let me ask you a question. You believe the classes, because she was in the midst of the class, you believe what you're learning uh, is helping your spirit, helping you spiritually. She says, yeah, absolutely. She'd seen a few miracles or whatever. I said, now let me ask you, how much you pay for your socks? Five dollars. I said, so you don't want to pay anything for the Kabbalah classes, but you want to pay five dollars for your socks. So what are you telling the universe? That your soul is worth nothing and your socks are worth five dollars. You should have seen the look on her face. But we have to realize that in essence is what we're saying. Because wherever you put your money, your energy, your time, your talents and abilities, that's where you feel you're getting the most value. So our job this morning is to up the value of the light. How much is the light worth? When people are in those dire situations, what are they willing to give for health? What are they willing to give for love and peace of mind and health for their children or good for their children? That's the consciousness. So we want to learn this morning. Yes, we are already prosperous. We already have it all. Our job is to act, 
to share as if we know with certainty the Creator is the source of all of our good. And as we will do that and just share freely and abundantly light in all the proactive sharing ways, then we will truly be prosperity, prosperous. And remember, there's not one of us who's replaceable. Each one of us are irreplaceable in the world. Nobody can take our place. We've already been given everything. I just suggest and empower us all to live into that so we will truly be prosperous people. God bless.